Sanskrit, IAST, Samskrta, Sanskrit, Sanskritam also is a language of ancient India with a documented history of about 3,500 years. It is the primary liturgical language of Hinduism, the predominant language of most works of Hindu philosophy as well as some of the principal texts of Buddhism and Jainism. Sanskrit, in its various variants and dialects, was the lingua franca of ancient and medieval India. In the early 1st millennium CE, along with Buddhism and Hinduism, Sanskrit migrated to Southeast Asia, parts of East Asia and Central Asia, emerging as a language of high culture and of local ruling elites in these regions. Sanskrit is an old Indo Aryan language. As one of the oldest documented members of the Indo European family of languages, Sanskrit holds a prominent position in Indo European studies. It is related to Greek and Latin, as well as Hittite, Luwian, Old Avestan and many other extinct languages with historical significance to Europe, West Asia and Central Asia. It traces its linguistic ancestry to the Proto-Indo-Aryan language, Proto-Indo-Iranian and the Proto-Indo-European languages. Sanskrit is traceable to the 2nd millennium BCE in a form known as the Vedic Sanskrit, with the Rigveda as the earliest surviving text. A more refined and standardized grammatical form called the Classical Sanskrit emerged in mid-first millennium BCE with the Astadayi treatise of Panini. Sanskrit, though not necessarily Classical Sanskrit, is the root language of many Prakrit languages. Examples include numerous modern daughter northern Indian subcontinental languages such as Hindi, Marathi, Bengali, Punjabi and Nepali. The body of Sanskrit literature encompasses a rich tradition of philosophical and religious texts, as well as poetry, music, drama, scientific, technical and other texts. In the ancient era, Sanskrit compositions were orally transmitted by methods of memorization of exceptional complexity, rigor and fidelity. The earliest known inscriptions in Sanskrit are from the 1st century BCE, such as the few discovered in Ayodhya and Gosundi Hathabada Sanskrit texts dated to the 1st millennium CE were written in the Brahmi script, the Nagari script, the historic South Indian scripts and their derivative scripts. Sanskrit is one of the 22 languages listed in the 8th schedule of the Constitution of India. It continues to be widely used as a ceremonial and ritual language in Hinduism and some Buddhist practices such as hymns and chants. Etymology and nomenclature The Sanskrit verbal adjective samskrta is a compound word consisting of sams together, good, well, perfected and krta made, formed, work. It connotes a work that has been well prepared, pure and perfect, polished, sacred. According to Biderman, the perfection contextually being referred to in the etymological origins of the word is its tonal qualities, rather than semantic. Sound and oral transmission were highly valued quality in ancient India, and its sages refined the alphabet, the structure of words, and its exacting grammar into a collection of sounds, a kind of sublime musical mold. States Biderman, as an integral language they called Sanskrit. From late Vedic period onwards, state Annette Wilkie and Oliver Meebus, resonating sound and its musical foundations attracted an exceptionally large amount of linguistic, philosophical and religious literature. In India, the sound was visualized as pervading all creation, another representation of the world itself, the mysterious magnum of the Hindu thought. The search for perfection in thought and of salvation was one of the dimensions of sacred sound, and the common thread to weave all ideas and inspirations became the quest for what the ancient Indians believed to be a perfect language, the phonocentric episteme of Sanskrit. Sanskrit as a language competed with numerous less exact vernacular Indian languages called Prakritic languages prakrta. The term Prakrta literally means, original, natural, normal, artless, states Franklin Southworth. The relationship between Prakrit and Sanskrit is found in the Indian texts dated to the first millennium CE. Patanjali acknowledged that Prakrit is the first language, one instinctively adopted by every child with all its imperfections and later leads to the problems of interpretation and misunderstanding. The purifying structure of the Sanskrit language removes these imperfections. The early Sanskrit grammarian Dandan states, for example, that much in the Prakrit languages is etymologically rooted in Sanskrit but involved loss of sounds, and corruptions that result from a disregard of the grammar. Dandan acknowledged that there are words and confusing structures in Prakrit that thrive independent of Sanskrit. 
This view is found in the writing of Bharata Muni, the author of the ancient Natyasastra text. The early Jain scholar Namisadu acknowledged the difference, but disagreed that the Prakrit language was a corruption of Sanskrit. Namisadu stated that the Prakrit language was the purvam came before, origin, and they came naturally to women and children, that Sanskrit was a refinement of the Prakrit through a purification by grammar. History Origin and development Sanskrit belongs to the Indo-European family of languages. It is one of the three ancient documented languages that likely arose from a common root language now referred to as the Proto-Indo-European language Vedic Sanskrit c. 1500-500 BCE Mycenaean Greek c. 1450 BCE and Ancient Greek c. 750-400 BC. Mycenaean Greek is the older recorded form of Greek, but the limited material that has survived has a highly ambiguous writing system. More important to Indo-European studies is Ancient Greek, documented extensively beginning with the two Homeric poems the Iliad and the Odyssey, c. 750 BC. Hittite c. 1750-1200 BCE. This is the earliest recorded of all Indo-European languages, distinguishable into Old Hittite, Middle Hittite and Neo-Hittite. It is divergent from the others likely due to its early separation. Discovered on clay tablets of central Turkey in cuneiform script, it possesses some highly archaic features found only fragmentarily, if at all, in other languages. At the same time, however, it appears to have undergone a large number of early phonological and grammatical changes along with the ambiguities of its writing system. Other Indo-European languages related to Sanskrit include archaic and classical Latin, c. 600 BCE to 100 CE, Old Italian, Gothic, archaic Germanic language, c. 350 CE, Old Norse, c. 200 CE and after, Old Avestan c. late 2nd millennium BCE and Younger Avestan c. 900 BCE. The closest ancient relatives of Vedic Sanskrit in the Indo-European languages are the Nuristani language found in the remote Hindu Kush region of the northeastern Afghanistan and northwestern Himalayas, as well as the extinct Avestan and Old Persian, both Iranian languages. Colonial era scholars familiar with Latin and Greek were struck by the resemblance of the Sanskrit language, both its vocabulary and grammar, to the classical languages of Europe. It suggested a common root and historical links between some of the major distant ancient languages of the world. William Jones remarked, The Sanskrit language, whatever be its antiquity, is of a wonderful structure, more perfect than the Greek, more copious than the Latin, and more exquisitely refined than either, yet bearing to both of them a stronger affinity, both in the roots of verbs and the forms of grammar, than could possibly have been produced by accident, so strong indeed, that no philologer could examine them all three, without believing them to have sprung from some common source, which, perhaps, no longer exists. There is a similar reason, though not quite so forcible, for supposing that both the Gothic and the Celtic Sikh, though blended with a very different idiom, had the same origin with the Sanskrit, and the Old Persian might be added to the same family. In order to explain the common features shared by Sanskrit and other Indo-European languages, the Indo-Aryan migration theory states that the original speakers of what became Sanskrit arrived in the Indian subcontinent from the northwest sometime during the early 2nd millennium BCE. Evidence for such a theory includes the close relationship between the Indo-Iranian tongues and the Baltic and Slavic languages, vocabulary exchange with the non-Indo-European Uralic languages, and the nature of the attested Indo-European words for flora and fauna. The pre-history of Indo-Aryan languages which preceded Vedic Sanskrit is unclear and various hypotheses place it over a fairly wide limit. According to Thomas Burrow, based on the relationship between various Indo-European languages, the origin of all these languages may possibly be in what is now Central or Eastern Europe, while the Indo-Iranian group possibly arose in Central Russia. The Iranian and Indo-Aryan branches separated quite early. It is the Indo-Aryan branch that moved into Eastern Iran and the South into the Indian subcontinent in the first half of the 2nd millennium BCE. Once in ancient India, the Indo-Aryan language underwent rapid linguistic change and morphed into the Vedic Sanskrit language. <inaudible> Vedic Sanskrit 
The pre-classical form of Sanskrit is known as Vedic Sanskrit. The earliest attested Sanskrit text is the Rigveda, a Hindu scripture, from the mid to late 2nd millennium BCE. No written records from such an early period survive if they ever existed. However, scholars are confident that the oral transmission of the texts is reliable, they were ceremonial literature where the exact phonetic expression and its preservation were a part of the historic tradition. The Rigveda is a collection of books, created by multiple authors from distant parts of ancient India. These authors represented different generations, and the mandalas 2 to 7 are the oldest, while the mandalas 1 and 10 are relatively the youngest. Yet, the Vedic Sanskrit in these books of the Rigveda hardly presents any dialectical diversity, states Louis Renu, an Indologist known for his scholarship of the Sanskrit literature and the Rigveda in particular. According to Renu, this implies that the Vedic Sanskrit language had a set linguistic pattern by the second half of the second millennium BCE. Beyond the Rigveda, the ancient literature in Vedic Sanskrit that has survived into the modern age include the Samaveda, Yajurveda, Atharvaveda along with the embedded and layered Vedic texts such as the Brahmanas, Aranyakas and the early Upanishads. These Vedic documents reflect the dialects of Sanskrit found in the various parts of the northwestern, northern and eastern Indian subcontinent. Vedic Sanskrit was both a spoken and literary language of ancient India. According to Michael Witzel, Vedic Sanskrit was a spoken language of the semi-nomadic Aryas who temporarily settled in one place, maintained cattle herds, practiced limited agriculture and after some time moved by wagon train they called grama. The Vedic Sanskrit language or a closely related Indo-European variant was recognized beyond ancient India as evidenced by the Mitanni Treaty between the ancient Hittite and Mitanni people, carved into a rock, in a region that are now parts of Syria and Turkey. Parts of this treaty such as the names of the Mitannian princes and technical terms related to horse training, for reasons not understood, are in early forms of Vedic Sanskrit. The treaty also invokes the gods Varuna, Mitra, Indra and Nasatya found in the earliest layers of the Vedic literature. The Vedic Sanskrit found in the Rigveda is distinctly more archaic than other Vedic texts, and in many respects, the Rigvedic language is notably more similar to those found in the archaic texts of Old Avestan Zoroastrian Gathas and Homer's Iliad and Odyssey. According to Stephanie W. Jameson and Joel P. Brereton, Indologists known for their translation of the Rigveda, the Vedic Sanskrit literature, clearly inherited. From Indo-Iranian and Indo-European times, the social structures such as the role of the poet and the priests, the patronage economy, the phrasal equations and some of the poetic meters. While there are similarities, state Jameson and Brereton, there are also differences between Vedic Sanskrit, the Old Avestan, and the Mycenaean Greek literature. For example, unlike the Sanskrit similes in the Rigveda, the Old Avestan Gathas lack simile entirely, and it is rare in the later version of the language. The Homerian Greek, like Rigvedic Sanskrit, deploys simile extensively, but they are structurally very different. Topic: <laughs> <laughs> Classical Sanskrit. The early Vedic form of the Sanskrit language was far less homogeneous, and it evolved over time into a more structured and homogeneous language, ultimately into the Classical Sanskrit by about the mid 1 Street millennium BCE. According to Richard Gombrich, an Indologist and a scholar of Sanskrit, Pali and Buddhist studies, the archaic Vedic Sanskrit found in the Rigveda had already evolved in the Vedic period, as evidenced in the later Vedic literature. The language in the early Upanishads of Hinduism and the late Vedic literature approaches classical Sanskrit, while the archaic Vedic Sanskrit had by the Buddha's time become unintelligible to all except ancient Indian sages, states Gombrich. The formalization of the Sanskrit language is credited to Panini, along with Patanjali's Mahabhasya and Katyayana's commentary that preceded Patanjali's work. Panini composed Astadhyayi, eight chapter grammar. The century in which he lived is unclear and debated, but his work is generally accepted to be from sometime between 6th and 4th centuries BCE. The Astadhyayi was not the first description of Sanskrit grammar, but it is the earliest that has survived in full. Panini cites ten scholars on the phonological and grammatical aspects of the Sanskrit language before him, as well as the variants in the usage of Sanskrit in different regions of India. The ten Vedic scholars he quotes are Apasali, Kashyapa, Gargya, Galava, Kakravarmana, Bharadvaja, Sakatayana, Sakalya, Sanaka and Svotayana. The Astadhyayi of Panini became the foundation of Vyakarana, a Vedanga. 
In the Astadai, language is observed in a manner that has no parallel among Greek or Latin grammarians. Panini's grammar, according to Renu and Filioset, defines the linguistic expression and a classic that set the standard for the Sanskrit language. Panini made use of a technical metalanguage consisting of a syntax, morphology and lexicon. This metalanguage is organized according to a series of meta-rules, some of which are explicitly stated while others can be deduced. Panini's comprehensive and scientific theory of grammar is conventionally taken to mark the start of classical Sanskrit. His systematic treatise inspired and made Sanskrit the preeminent Indian language of learning and literature for two millennia. It is unclear whether Panini wrote his treatise on Sanskrit language or he orally created the detailed and sophisticated treatise then transmitted it through his students. Modern scholarship generally accepts that he knew of a form of writing, based on references to words such as lippi script, and lipikara scribe. In section 3.2 of the Astadhyayi, the classical Sanskrit language formalized by Panini, states Renu, is not an impoverished language. Rather it is a controlled and a restrained language from which archaisms and unnecessary formal alternatives were excluded. The classical form of the language simplified the Sandhi rules but retained various aspects of the Vedic language, while adding rigor and flexibilities, so that it had sufficient means to express thoughts as well as being capable of responding to the future increasing demands of an infinitely diversified literature." According to Renu, Panini included numerous «optional rules» beyond the Vedic Sanskrit's Bahulam framework, to respect liberty and creativity so that individual writers separated by geography or time would have the choice to express facts and their views in their own way, where tradition followed competitive forms of the Sanskrit language. The phonetic differences between Vedic Sanskrit and Classical Sanskrit are negligible when compared to the intense change that must have occurred in the pre-Vedic period between Indo-Aryan language and the Vedic Sanskrit. The noticeable differences between the Vedic and the Classical Sanskrit include the much expanded grammar and grammatical categories as well as the differences in the accent, the semantics and the syntax. There are also some differences between how some of the nouns and verbs end, as well as the Sandhi rules, both internal and external. Quite many words found in the early Vedic Sanskrit language are never found in late Vedic Sanskrit or Classical Sanskrit literature, while some words have different and new meanings in Classical Sanskrit when contextually compared to the early Vedic Sanskrit literature. Arthur MacDonnell was among the early colonial era scholars who summarized some of the differences between the Vedic and Classical Sanskrit. Louis Renou published in 1956, in French, a more extensive discussion of the similarities, the differences, and the evolution of the Vedic Sanskrit within the Vedic period and then to the classical Sanskrit along with his views on the history. This work has been translated by Jagbans Balbir. <laughs> Sanskrit and Prakrit languages The earliest known use of the word samskrta Sanskrit, in the context of a language, is found in verses 3.16.14 and 5.28.17-19 of the Ramayana. Sanskrit co-existed with numerous other Prakrit languages of ancient India. The Prakrit languages of India also have ancient roots and some Sanskrit scholars have called these apabramsa, literally, spoiled. The Vedic literature includes words whose phonetic equivalent are not found in other Indo-European languages but which are found in the regional Prakrit languages, which makes it likely that the interaction, the sharing of words and ideas began early in the Indian history. As the Indian thought diversified and challenged earlier beliefs of Hinduism, particularly in the form of Buddhism and Jainism, the Prakrit languages such as Pali in Theravada Buddhism and Ardhamagadi in Jainism competed with Sanskrit in the ancient times. However, states Paul Dundas, a scholar of Jainism, these ancient Prakrit languages had "...roughly the same relationship to Sanskrit as medieval Italian does to Latin." The Indian tradition states that the Buddha and the Mahavira preferred Prakrit language so that everyone could understand it. However, scholars such as Dundas have questioned this hypothesis. They state that there is no evidence for this and whatever evidence is available suggests that by the start of the Common Era, hardly anybody other than learned monks had the capacity to understand the old Prakrit languages such as Artamagadi. Colonial era scholars questioned whether Sanskrit was ever a spoken language, or was it only a literary language? Scholars disagree in their answers. 
A section of Western scholars state that Sanskrit was never a spoken language, while others and particularly most Indian scholars state the opposite. Those who affirm Sanskrit to have been a vernacular language point to the necessity of Sanskrit being a spoken language for the oral tradition that preserved the vast number of Sanskrit manuscripts from ancient India. Secondly, they state that the textual evidence in the works of Yaksa, Panini and Patanajali affirms that the classical Sanskrit in their era was a language that is spoken by the cultured and educated. Some sutras expound upon the variant forms of spoken Sanskrit versus written Sanskrit. The 7th century Chinese Buddhist pilgrim Xuanzang mentioned in his memoir that official philosophical debates in India were held in Sanskrit, not in the vernacular language of that region. According to Sanskrit linguist Madhav Deshpande, Sanskrit was a spoken language in a colloquial form by the mid 1st millennium BCE, which coexisted with a more formal, grammatical correct form of literary Sanskrit. This, states Deshpande, is true for modern languages where colloquial incorrect approximations and dialects of a language are spoken and understood, along with more refined, sophisticated and grammatically accurate forms of the same language being found in the literary works. The Indian tradition, states Mora's Winternitz, has favoured the learning and the usage of multiple languages from the ancient times. Sanskrit was a spoken language in the educated and the elite classes, but it was also a language that must have been understood in a more wider circle of society because the widely popular folk epics and stories such as the Ramayana, the Mahabharata, the Bhagavata Purana, the Panchatantra and many other texts are all in the Sanskrit language. The classical Sanskrit with its exacting grammar was thus the language of the Indian scholars and the educated classes, while others communicated with approximate or ungrammatical variants of it as well as other natural Indian languages. Sanskrit, as the learned language of ancient India, thus existed alongside the vernacular Prakrits. Many Sanskrit dramas indicate that the language coexisted with the vernacular Prakrits. Centers in Varanasi, Pathan, Pune and Kanchipuram were centers of classical Sanskrit learning and public debates until the arrival of the colonial era. According to Etienne Lamotte, an Indologist and Buddhism scholar, Sanskrit became the dominant literary and inscriptional language because of its precision in communication. It was, states Lamotte, an ideal instrument for presenting ideas and as knowledge in Sanskrit multiplied so did its spread and influence. Sanskrit was adopted voluntarily as a vehicle of high culture, arts, and profound ideas. Pollock disagrees with Lamotte, but concurs that Sanskrit's influence grew into what he terms as Sanskrit cosmopolis, over a region that included all of South Asia and much of Southeast Asia. The Sanskrit language cosmopolis thrived beyond India between 300 and 1300 CE. Influence Sanskrit has been the predominant language of Hindu texts encompassing a rich tradition of philosophical and religious texts, as well as poetry, music, drama, scientific, technical and others. It is the predominant language of one of the largest collection of historic manuscripts. The earliest known inscriptions in Sanskrit are from the 1st century BCE, such as the Ayodhya inscription of Dana and Gosundi Hathabada Chittorgar. .Though developed and nurtured by scholars of orthodox schools of Hinduism, Sanskrit has been the language for some of the key literary works and theology of heterodox schools of Indian philosophies such as Buddhism and Jainism. The structure and capabilities of the classical Sanskrit language launched ancient Indian speculations about the nature and function of language. What is the relationship between words and their meanings in the context of a community of speakers, whether this relationship is objective or subjective, discovered or is created, how individuals learn and relate to the world around them through language, and about the limits of language. They speculated on the role of language, the ontological status of painting word images through sound, and the need for rules so that it can serve as a means for a community of speakers, separated by geography or time, to share and understand profound ideas from each other. These speculations became particularly important to the Mimamsa and the Nyaya schools of Hindu philosophy, and later to Vedanta and Mahayana Buddhism, states Fritz Stahl, a scholar of linguistics with a focus on Indian philosophies and Sanskrit. Though written in a number of different scripts, the dominant language of Hindu texts has been Sanskrit. It or a hybrid form of Sanskrit became the preferred language of Mahayana Buddhism scholarship. One of the early and influential Buddhist philosopher Nagarjuna tilde 200 CE, for example, used classical Sanskrit as the language for his texts. 
According to Renu, Sanskrit had a limited role in the Theravada tradition formerly known as the Hinayana but the Prakrit works that have survived are of doubtful authenticity. Some of the canonical fragments of the early Buddhist traditions, discovered in the 20th century, suggest the early Buddhist traditions did use of imperfect and reasonably good Sanskrit, sometimes with a Pali syntax, states Renu. The Mahasamgika and Mahavasta, in their late Hinayana forms, used hybrid Sanskrit for their literature. Sanskrit was also the language of some of the oldest surviving, authoritative and much followed philosophical works of Jainism such as the Tattvartha Sutra by Umaswati. The Sanskrit language has been one of the major means for the transmission of knowledge and ideas in Asian history. Indian texts in Sanskrit were already in China by 402 CE, carried by the influential Buddhist pilgrim Faxian who translated them into Chinese by 418 CE. Xuanzang, another Chinese Buddhist pilgrim, learned Sanskrit in India and carried 657 Sanskrit texts to China in the 7th century where he established a major center of learning and language translation under the patronage of Emperor Taizong. By the early 1st millennium CE, Sanskrit had spread Buddhist and Hindu ideas to Southeast Asia, parts of the East Asia and the Central Asia. It was accepted as a language of high culture and the preferred language by some of the local ruling elites in these regions. According to the Dalai Lama, the Sanskrit language is a parent language that is at the foundation of many modern languages of India and the one that promoted Indian thought to other distant countries. In Tibetan Buddhism, states the Dalai Lama, Sanskrit language has been a revered one and called Legar Lhai Ka or, elegant language of the gods. It has been the means of transmitting the, profound wisdom of Buddhist philosophy. To Tibet, the Sanskrit language created a pan-Indic accessibility to information and knowledge in the ancient and medieval times, in contrast to the Prakrit languages which were understood just regionally. It created a cultural bond across the subcontinent. As local languages and dialects evolved and diversified, Sanskrit served as the common language. It connected scholars from distant parts of the Indian subcontinent such as Tamil Nadu and Kashmir, states Deshpande, as well as those from different fields of studies, though there must have been differences in its pronunciation given the first language of the respective speakers. The Sanskrit language brought Indic people together, particularly its elite scholars. Some of these scholars of Indian history regionally produced vernacularized Sanskrit to reach wider audiences, as evidenced by texts discovered in Rajasthan, Gujarat, and Maharashtra. Once the audience became familiar with the easier-to-understand vernacularized version of Sanskrit, those interested could graduate from colloquial Sanskrit to the more advanced classical Sanskrit. Rituals and the rites of passage ceremonies have been and continue to be the other occasions where a wide spectrum of people hear Sanskrit, and occasionally join in to speak some Sanskrit words such as Nama. Classical Sanskrit is the standard register as laid out in the grammar of Panini, around the 4th century BCE. Its position in the cultures of Greater India is akin to that of Latin and Ancient Greek in Europe. Sanskrit has significantly influenced most modern languages of the Indian subcontinent, particularly the languages of the northern, western, central and eastern Indian subcontinent. Decline Sanskrit declined starting about and after the 13th century. This coincides with the beginning of Islamic invasions of the Indian subcontinent to create, thereafter expand the Muslim rule in the form of sultanates and later the Mughal Empire. With the fall of Kashmir around the 13th century, a premier centre of Sanskrit literary creativity, Sanskrit literature there disappeared, perhaps in the "...fires that periodically engulfed the capital of Kashmir", or the "...Mongol invasion of 1320", states Sheldon Pollock. The Sanskrit literature which was once widely disseminated out of the northwest regions of the subcontinent, stopped after the 12th century. As Hindu kingdoms fell in the eastern and the south India, such as the great Vijayanagara Empire, so did Sanskrit. There were exceptions and short periods of imperial support for Sanskrit, mostly concentrated during the reign of the tolerant Mughal emperor Akbar. Muslim rulers patronized the Middle Eastern language and scripts found in Persia and Arabia, and the Indians linguistically adapted to this Persianization to gain employment with the Muslim rulers. Hindu rulers such as Shivaji of the Maratha Empire, reversed the process, by re-adopting Sanskrit and re-asserting their socio-linguistic identity. 
After Islamic rule disintegrated in the Indian subcontinent and the colonial rule era began, Sanskrit re-emerged but in the form of a ''ghostly existence'' in regions such as Bengal. This decline was the result of ''political institutions and civic ethos'' that did not support the historic Sanskrit literary culture. Scholars are divided on whether or when Sanskrit died. Western authors such as John Snelling state that Sanskrit and Pali are both dead Indian languages. Indian authors such as M. Ramakrishnan Nair state that Sanskrit was a dead language by the first millennium BCE. Sheldon Pollock states that in some crucial way, Sanskrit is dead. After the 12th century, the Sanskrit literary works were reduced to reinscription and restatements of ideas already explored, and any creativity was restricted to hymns and verses. This contrasted with the previous 1,500 years when great experiments in moral and aesthetic imagination marked the Indian scholarship using classical Sanskrit, states Pollock. Other scholars state that Sanskrit language did not die, only declined. Hanader disagrees with Pollock, finding his arguments elegant but often arbitrary. According to Hanader, a decline or regional absence of creative and innovative literature constitutes a negative evidence to Pollock's hypothesis, but it is not positive evidence. A closer look at Sanskrit in the Indian history after the 12th century suggests that Sanskrit survived despite the odds. According to Hanader, On a more public level the statement that Sanskrit is a dead language is misleading, for Sanskrit is quite obviously not as dead as other dead languages and the fact that it is spoken, written and read will probably convince most people that it cannot be a dead language in the most common usage of the term. Pollock's notion of the death of Sanskrit remains in this unclear realm between academia and public opinion when he says that most observers would agree that, in some crucial way, Sanskrit is dead. The Sanskrit language, states Mora's Winternitz, was never a dead language and it is still alive though its prevalence is lesser than ancient and medieval times. Sanskrit remains an integral part of Hindu journals, festivals, Ramlila plays, drama, rituals and the rites of passage. Similarly, Brian Hatcher states that the metaphors of historical rupture by Pollock are not valid, that there is ample proof that Sanskrit was very much alive in the narrow confines of surviving Hindu kingdoms between the 13th and 18th century, and its reverence and tradition continues. Hanader states that modern works in Sanskrit are either ignored or their modernity contested. According to Robert Goldman and Sally Sutherland, Sanskrit is neither dead nor living in the conventional sense. It is a special, timeless language that lives in the numerous manuscripts, daily chants and ceremonial recitations, a heritage language that Indians contextually prize and some practice. When the British introduced English to India in the 19th century, knowledge of Sanskrit and ancient literature continued to flourish as the study of Sanskrit changed from a more traditional style into a form of analytical and comparative scholarship mirroring that of Europe. Modern Indic languages The relationship of Sanskrit to the Prakrit languages, particularly the modern form of Indian languages, is complex and spans about 3,500 years, states Colin Masika, a linguist specializing in South Asian languages. A part of the difficulty is the lack of sufficient textual, archaeological and epigraphical evidence for the ancient Prakrit languages with rare exceptions such as Pali, leading to a tendency of anachronistic errors. Sanskrit and Prakrit languages may be divided into Old Indo-Aryan 1500 BCE to 600 BCE, Middle Indo-Aryan 600 BCE to 1000 CE and New Indo-Aryan 1000 CE current. Each can further be subdivided in early, middle or second and late evolutionary substages. Vedic Sanskrit belongs to the early Old Indo-Aryan while classical Sanskrit to the later Old Indo-Aryan stage. The evidence for Prakrits such as Pali Theravada Buddhism and Ardhamagadhi Jainism, along with Magadhi, Maharashtri, Sinhala, Saurasini and Nia Gandhari, emerge in the Middle Indo-Aryan stage in two versions, archaic and more formalized, that may be placed in early and middle substages of the 600 BCE to 1000 CE period. Two literary Indic languages can be traced to the late Middle Indo-Aryan stage and these are Apabramsa and Elu a form of literary Sinhalese. 
Numerous North, Central, Eastern and Western Indian languages, such as Hindi, Gujarati, Sindhi, Punjabi, Kashmiri, Nepali, Braj, Awadhi, Bengali, Assamese, Oriya, Marathi, and others belong to the new Indo-Aryan stage. There is an extensive overlap in the vocabulary, phonetics and other aspects of these new Indo-Aryan languages with Sanskrit, but it is neither universal nor identical across the languages. They likely emerged from a synthesis of the ancient Sanskrit language traditions and an admixture of various regional dialects. Each language has some unique and regionally creative aspects, with unclear origins. Prakrit languages do have a grammatical structure, but like the Vedic Sanskrit, it is far less rigorous than classical Sanskrit. The roots of all Prakrit languages may be in the Vedic Sanskrit and ultimately the Indo-Aryan language, their structural details vary from the classical Sanskrit. It is generally accepted by scholars and widely believed in India that the modern Indic languages, such as Bengali, Gujarati, Hindi and Punjabi are descendants of the Sanskrit language. Sanskrit, states Burjoravari, can be described as the mother language of almost all the languages of North India. <laughs> <laughs> Geographic distribution The Sanskrit language's historic presence is attested across a wide geography beyond the Indian subcontinent. Inscriptions and literary evidence suggests that Sanskrit language was already being adopted in Southeast Asia and Central Asia in the first millennium CE. Through monks, religious pilgrims, and merchants, the Indian subcontinent has been the geographic range of the largest collection of the ancient and pre 18th century Sanskrit manuscripts and inscriptions. Beyond ancient India, significant collections of Sanskrit manuscripts and inscriptions have been found in China particularly the Tibetan monasteries, Myanmar, Indonesia, Cambodia, Laos, Vietnam, Thailand, and Malaysia. Sanskrit inscriptions, manuscripts or its remnants, including some of the oldest known Sanskrit written texts, have been discovered in dry high deserts and mountainous terrains such as in Nepal, Tibet, Afghanistan, Mongolia, Uzbekistan, Turkmenistan, Tajikistan, and Kazakhstan. Some Sanskrit texts and inscriptions have also been discovered in Korea and Japan. Topic: Contemporary distribution. Sanskrit is a studied school subject in contemporary India, but scarce as a first language. In the 2001 census of India, 14,135 Indians reported Sanskrit to be their first language. In the 2011 census, 24,821 people out of about 1.21 billion reported Sanskrit to be their first language. According to the 2011 National Census of Nepal, 1,669 people use Sanskrit as their first language. However, on investigation, none of these claims have been verified. Official status In India, Sanskrit is among the 22 official languages of India in the 8th Schedule to the Constitution. The state of Uttarakhand in India lists Sanskrit as its second official language. Phonology Sanskrit shares many Proto-Indo-European phonological features, although it features a larger inventory of distinct phonemes. The consonantal system is the same, though it systematically enlarged the inventory of distinct sounds. For example, Sanskrit added a voiceless aspirated th to the voiceless t, voiced d, and voiced aspirated dh. Found in Pi languages, the most significant and distinctive phonological development in Sanskrit is vowel merger, states Stephanie Jameson, an Indo European linguist specializing in Sanskrit literature. The short e, o, and asterisk a, all merge as a. A in Sanskrit, while long, and asterisk a, all merge as long. A. A. These mergers occurred very early and significantly impacted Sanskrit's morphological system. Some phonological developments in it mirror those in other Pi languages. For example, the labiovelars merged with the plain velars as in other Satim languages. However, the secondary palatalization of the resulting segments is more thorough and systematic within Sanskrit, states Jameson. A series of retroflex dental stops were innovated in Sanskrit to more thoroughly articulate sounds for clarity. 
For example, unlike the loss of the morphological clarity from vowel contraction that is found in early Greek and related Southeast European languages, Sanskrit deployed y, w, and s intervocalically to provide morphological clarity. Vowels The cardinal vowels svaras i, i, u, u, a, a distinguished length in Sanskrit, states Jameson. The short a, a in Sanskrit is a closer vowel than a, equivalent to schwa. The mid vowels e, e and o, o in Sanskrit are monophthongizations of the Indo Iranian diphthongs i and o. The Old Iranian language preserved asterisk i and o. In contrast, in Sanskrit, they are inherently long. The vocalic liquid r, in Sanskrit is a merger of pi r, and l. The long r, is an innovation and it is used in a few analogically generated morphological categories. According to Masika, Sanskrit has four traditional semivowels, with which were classed. For morphophonemic reasons, the liquids, y, r, l, and v, that is, as y and v were the non-syllabics corresponding to i, u, so were r, l in relation to r, and l. The northwestern, the central and the eastern Sanskrit dialects have had a historic confusion between r and l. The Paninian system that followed the central dialect preserved the distinction, likely out of reverence for the Vedic Sanskrit that distinguished the r and l. However, the northwestern dialect only had r, while the eastern dialect probably only had l, states Masika. Thus literary works from different parts of ancient India appear inconsistent in their use of r and l, resulting in doublets that is occasionally semantically differentiated. Consonants Sanskrit possesses a symmetric consonantal phoneme structure based on how the sound is articulated, though the actual usage of these sounds conceals the lack of parallelism in the apparent symmetry possibly from historical changes within the language. The glides and liquids regularly alternate with vowels in Sanskrit, for example, I approximately equals Y, U approximately equals V, W, R, approximately equals R, L, approximately equals L, states Jameson. Sanskrit had a series of retroflex stops. All the retroflexes in Sanskrit are in origin conditioned alternance of dentals, though from the beginning of the language they have a qualified independence. States Jameson, the palatals are affricates in Sanskrit, not stops. The palatal nasal is a conditioned variant of n occurring next to palatal obstruents. The anisvara that Sanskrit deploys is a conditioned alternate of postvocalic nasals, under certain sandy conditions. Its visarga is a word final or morpheme final conditioned alternate of s and r under certain sandy conditions. The voiceless aspirated series is also an innovation in Sanskrit but is significantly rarer than the other three series. While the Sanskrit language organizes sounds for expression beyond those found in the Pi language, it retained many features found in the Iranian and Balto Slavic languages. An example of a similar process in all three, states Jameson, is the retroflex sibilant, s being the automatic product of dental s following i, u, r, and k mnemonically, Ruki. <laughs> Phonological alternations, sandy rules Sanskrit deploys extensive phonological alternations on different linguistic levels through sandy rules literally, the rules of putting together, union, connection, alliance. This is similar to the English alteration of going to, as gunna, states Jameson. The Sanskrit language accepts such alterations within it, but offers formal rules for the sandy of any two words next to each other in the same sentence or linking two sentences. The external sandy rules state that similar short vowels coalesce into a single long vowel, while dissimilar vowels form glides or undergo diphthongization. Among the consonants, most external sandy rules recommend regressive assimilation for clarity when they are voiced. According to Jameson, these rules ordinarily apply at compound seams and morpheme boundaries. In Vedic Sanskrit, the external sandhi rules are more variable than in classical Sanskrit. The internal sandhi rules are more intricate and account for the root and the canonical structure of the Sanskrit word. These rules anticipate what are now known as the Bartholomew's law and Grassmann's law. For example, states Jameson, the 
voiceless, voiced, and voiced aspirated obstruents of a positional series regularly alternate with each other p approximately equals b approximately equals bh, t approximately equals d approximately equals dh, etc. Note, however, c approximately equals j approximately equals h, such that, for example, a morpheme with an underlying voiced aspirate final may show alternance with all three stops under differing internal Sandy conditions. The velar series K, G, G, H alternate with the palatal series C, J, H, while the structural position of the palatal series is modified into a retroflex cluster when followed by dental. This rule create two morphophonemically distinct series from a single palatal series. Vocalic alternations in the Sanskrit morphological system is termed strengthening and called guna and v riddhi in the preconsonantal versions. There is an equivalence to terms deployed in Indo-European descriptive grammars, wherein Sanskrit's unstrengthened state is same as the zero grade, guna corresponds to normal grade, while v riddhi is same as the lengthened state. The qualitative oblaut is not found in Sanskrit just like it is absent in Iranian, but Sanskrit retains quantitative oblaut through vowel strengthening. The transformations between unstrengthened to guna is prominent in the morphological system, states Jameson, while v riddhi is a particularly significant rule when adjectives of origin and appurtenance are derived. The manner in which this is done slightly differs between the Vedic and the classical Sanskrit. Sanskrit grants a very flexible syllable structure, where they may begin or end with vowels, be single consonants or clusters. Similarly, the syllable may have an internal vowel of any weight. The Vedic Sanskrit shows traces of following the sievers edgerton law, but classical Sanskrit doesn't. Vedic Sanskrit has a pitch accent system, states Jameson, which were acknowledged by Panini, but in his classical Sanskrit the accents disappear. Most Vedic Sanskrit words have one accent. However, this accent is not phonologically predictable, states Jameson. It can fall anywhere in the word and its position often conveys morphological and syntactic information. According to Masika, the presence of an accent system in Vedic Sanskrit is evidenced from the markings in the Vedic texts. This is important because of Sanskrit's connection to the Pi languages and comparative Indo European linguistics. Sanskrit, like most early Indo European languages, lost the so called laryngeal consonants cover symbol H present in the Proto Indo European, states Jameson. This significantly impacted the evolutionary path of the Sanskrit phonology and morphology, particularly in the variant forms of roots. Morphology The basis of Sanskrit morphology is the root, states Jameson, a morpheme bearing lexical meaning. The verbal and nominal stems of Sanskrit words are derived from this root through the phonological vowel gradation processes, the addition of affixes, verbal and nominal stems. It then adds an ending to establish the grammatical and syntactic identity of the stem. According to Jameson, the three major formal elements of the morphology are I root, e affix, and e ending, and they are roughly responsible for I lexical meaning, e derivation, and e inflection respectively. A Sanskrit word has the following canonical structure root plus affix 0 n plus ending 0 to 1 The root structure has certain phonological constraints. Two of the most important constraints of a root is that it does not end in a short a, a and that it is monosyllabic. In contrast, the affixes and endings commonly do. The affixes in Sanskrit are almost always suffixes, with exceptions such as the augment a added as prefix to past tense verb forms and the na n infix in single verbal present class states jameson a verb in sanskrit has the following canonical structure root plus suffix tense aspect plus suffix mood plus ending personal number voice according to ruppel verbs in sanskrit express the same information as other indo-european languages such as english sanskrit verbs describe an action or occurrence or state its embedded morphology informs as to who is doing it? Person or persons. When it is done. Tense. And. How it is done. Mood. Voice. The Indo-European languages differ in the detail. For example, the Sanskrit language attaches the affixes and ending to the verb root, while the English language adds small independent words before the verb. In Sanskrit, these elements coexist within the word. 
Both verbs and nouns in Sanskrit are either thematic or athematic, states Jameson. Guna strengthened forms in the active singular regularly alternate in athematic verbs. The finite verbs of classical Sanskrit have the following grammatical categories, person, number, voice, tense aspect, and mood. According to Jameson, a portmanteau morpheme generally expresses the person number voice in Sanskrit, and sometimes also the ending or only the ending. The mood of the word is embedded in the affix. These elements of word architecture are the typical building blocks in classical Sanskrit, but in Vedic Sanskrit these elements fluctuate and are unclear. For example, in the Rigveda proverbs regularly occur in tmesis, states Jameson, which means they are separated from the finite verb. This indecisiveness is likely linked to Vedic Sanskrit's attempt to incorporate accent. With nonfinite forms of the verb and with nominal derivatives thereof, states Jameson, "...proverbs show much clearer univerbation in Vedic, both by position and by accent, and by classical Sanskrit, tmesis is no longer possible even with finite forms." While roots are typical in Sanskrit, some words do not follow the canonical structure. A few forms lack both inflection and root. Many words are inflected and can enter into derivation but lack a recognizable root. Examples from the basic vocabulary include kinship terms such as matar mother, nas nose, svan dog. According to Jameson, pronouns and some words outside the semantic categories also lack roots, as do the numerals. Similarly, the Sanskrit language is flexible enough to not mandate inflection. The Sanskrit words can contain more than one affix that interact with each other. Affixes in Sanskrit can be athematic as well as thematic, according to Jameson. Athematic affixes can be alternating. Sanskrit deploys eight cases, namely nominative, accusative, instrumental, dative, ablative, genitive, locative, vocative, stems, that is, root plus affix, appear in two categories in Sanskrit, vowel stems and consonant stems. Unlike some Indo-European languages such as Latin or Greek, according to Jameson, Sanskrit has no closed set of conventionally denoted noun declensions. Sanskrit includes a fairly large set of stem types. The linguistic interaction of the roots, the phonological segments, lexical items and the grammar for the classical Sanskrit consist of four Paninian components. These, states Paul Kaparsky, are the Astadayi, a comprehensive system of 4,000 grammatical rules, of which a small set are frequently used, Sivasutras, an inventory of Anubandis markers that partition phonological segments for efficient abbreviations through the Pratiharas technique, Datupatha, a list of 2,000 verbal roots classified by their morphology and syntactic properties using diacritic markers, a structure that guides its writing systems, and, the Gunapata, an inventory of word groups, classes of lexical systems. There are peripheral adjuncts to these four, such as the Unadasutras, which focus on irregularly formed derivatives from the roots. Sanskrit morphology is generally studied in two broad fundamental categories, the nominal forms and the verbal forms. These differ in the types of endings and what these endings mark in the grammatical context. Pronouns and nouns share the same grammatical categories, though they may differ in inflection. Verb-based adjectives and participles are not formally distinct from nouns. Adverbs are typically frozen case forms of adjectives, states Jameson, and nonfinite verbal forms such as infinitives and gerunds also clearly show frozen nominal case endings. Topic: <laughs> Tense and voice. The Sanskrit language includes five tenses: present, future, past imperfect, past aorist, and past perfect. It outlines three types of voices, active, passive and the middle. The middle is also referred to as the mediopassive, or more formally in Sanskrit as parasmipada word for another and atmanapada word for oneself. The paradigm for the tense aspect system in Sanskrit is the three-way contrast between the present, the aorist, and the perfect architecture. Vedic Sanskrit is more elaborate and had several additional tenses. For example, the Rigveda includes perfect and a marginal pluperfect. Classical Sanskrit simplifies the present system down to two tenses, the perfect and the imperfect, while the aorist stems retain the aorist tense and the perfect stems retain the perfect and marginal pluperfect. The classical version of the language has elaborate rules for both voice and the tense apsect system to emphasize clarity, and this is more elaborate than other Indo-European languages. 
The evolution of these systems can be seen from the earliest layers of the Vedic literature to the late Vedic literature. <laughs> Gender, mood Sanskrit recognizes three numbers, singular, dual, and plural. The dual is a fully functioning category, used beyond naturally paired objects such as hands or eyes, extending to any collection of two. The elliptical dual is notable in the Vedic Sanskrit, according to Jameson, where a noun in the dual signals a paired opposition. Illustrations include Dayava literally, the two heavens, for heaven and earth, Matara literally, the two mothers, for mother and father. A verb may be singular, dual or plural, while the person recognized in the language are forms of I, you, he, she, it, we, and they. There are three persons in Sanskrit, first, second and third. Sanskrit uses the three-by-three three grid formed by the three numbers and the three persons parameters as the paradigm and the basic building block of its verbal system. The Sanskrit language incorporates three genders, feminine, masculine and neuter. All nouns have inherent gender, but with some exceptions, personal pronouns have no gender. Exceptions include demonstrative and anaphoric pronouns. Derivation of a word is used to express the feminine. Two most common derivations come from feminine forming suffixes, the a, a rada, and i, i rukmani. The masculine and neuter are much simpler, and the difference between them is primarily inflectional. Similar affixes for the feminine are found in many Indo-European languages, states Burrow, suggesting links of the Sanskrit to its Pi heritage. Pronouns in Sanskrit include the personal pronouns of the first and second persons, unmarked for gender, and a larger number of gender-distinguishing pronouns and adjectives. Examples of the former include aham, first singular, vayam, first plural, and uyam, second plural. The latter can be demonstrative, deictic, or anaphoric. Both the Vedic and classical Sanskrit share the sa tam pronominal stem, and this is the closest element to a third-person pronoun and an article in the Sanskrit language, states Jameson. Indicative, potential, and imperative are the three mood forms in Sanskrit. Topic. Prosody, meter The Sanskrit language formally incorporates poetic meters. By the late Vedic era, this developed into a field of study and it was central to the composition of the Hindu literature including the later Vedic texts. This study of Sanskrit prosody is called chandas and considered as one of the six Vedangas, or limbs of Vedic studies. Sanskrit prosody includes linear and nonlinear systems. The system started off with seven major meters, according to Annette Wilkie and Oliver Meebus, called the seven birds, or seven mouths of Brihaspati, and each had its own rhythm, movements and aesthetics wherein a nonlinear structure a periodicity was mapped into a four-verse polymorphic linear sequence. A syllable in Sanskrit is classified as either lagu light or guru heavy. This classification is based on a matra literally, count, measure, duration. And typically a syllable that ends in a short vowel is a light syllable, while those that end in consonant, anasvara or visarga are heavy. The classical Sanskrit found in Hindu scriptures such as the Bhagavad Gita and many texts are so arranged that the light and heavy syllables in them follow a rhythm, though not necessarily a rhyme. Sanskrit meters include those based on a fixed number of syllables per verse, and those based on fixed number of more per verse. The Vedic Sanskrit employs 15 meters, of which 7 are common, and the most frequent are 3, 8, 11 and 12 syllable lines. The classical Sanskrit deploys both linear and nonlinear meters, many of which are based on syllables and others based on diligently crafted verses based on repeating numbers of more matra per foot. Meter and rhythm is an important part of the Sanskrit language. It may have played a role in helping preserve the integrity of the message and Sanskrit texts. The verse perfection in the Vedic texts such as the verse Upanishads and post-Vedic Smriti texts are rich in prosody. This feature of the Sanskrit language led some Indologists from the 19th century onwards to identify suspected portions of texts where a line or sections are off the expected meter. The meter feature of the Sanskrit language embeds another layer of communication to the listener or reader. A change in meters has been a tool of literary architecture and an embedded code to inform the reciter and audience that it marks the end of a section or chapter. Each section or chapter of these texts uses identical meters, rhythmically presenting their ideas and making it easier to remember, recall and check for accuracy. 
Authors coded a hymn's end by frequently using a verse of a meter different than that used in the hymn's body. However, the Hindu tradition does not use the Gayatri meter to end a hymn or composition, possibly because it has enjoyed a special level of reverence in Hinduism. Writing system The early history of writing Sanskrit and other languages in ancient India is a problematic topic despite a century of scholarship, states Richard Solomon, an epigraphist and Indologist specializing in Sanskrit and Pali literature. The earliest script from the Indian subcontinent is from the Indus Valley Civilization 3rd, 2nd millennium BCE, but this script remains undeciphered. Of the Vedic period that appeared after the Indus Valley Civilization, if any scripts for Vedic Sanskrit existed, they have not survived. Scholars generally accept that Sanskrit originated in an oral society, and that an oral tradition preserved the extensive Vedic and classical Sanskrit literature. Other scholars such as Jack Goody state that the Vedic Sanskrit texts are not the product of an oral society, basing this view by comparing inconsistencies in the transmitted versions of literature from various oral societies such as the Greek, Serbian and other cultures, then noting that the Vedic literature is too consistent and vast to have been composed and transmitted orally across generations, without being written down. Lippi is the term in Sanskrit which means, writing, letters, alphabet. It contextually refers to scripts, the art or any manner of writing or drawing. The term, in the sense of a writing system, appears in some of the earliest Buddhist, Hindu and Jaina texts. Panini's Astadayi composed sometime around the 5th or 4th century BCE, for example, mentions Lippi in the context of a writing script and education system in his times, but he does not name the script. Several early Buddhist and Jaina texts, such as the Lalitavistara Sutra and Panavana Sutta include lists of numerous writing scripts in ancient India. However, the reliability of these lists has been questioned and the empirical evidence of writing systems in the form of Sanskrit or Prakrit inscriptions dated prior to the 3rd century BCE has not been found. If the ancient surface for writing Sanskrit was palm leaves, tree bark and cloth, the same as those in later times, these have not survived. According to Solomon, many find it difficult to explain the evidently high level of political organization and cultural complexity of ancient India without a writing system for Sanskrit and other languages. The oldest datable writing systems for Sanskrit are the Brahmi script, the related Karasthi script, and the Brahmi derivatives. The Karasthi was used in the northwestern part of the Indian subcontinent and it became extinct, while the Brahmi was used in all over the subcontinent along with regional scripts such as Old Tamil. Of these, the earliest records in the Sanskrit language are in Brahmi, a script that later evolved into numerous related Indic scripts for Sanskrit, along with Southeast Asian scripts Burmese, Thai, Lao, Khmer, others, and many extinct Central Asian scripts such as those discovered along with the Karasthi in the Tarim Basin of Western China and in Uzbekistan. The most extensive inscriptions that have survived into the modern era are the rock edicts and pillar inscriptions of the 3rd century BCE Mauryan Emperor Ashoka, but these are not in Sanskrit. Scripts Sanskrit is written very precisely, states Ruppel. For every sound, it has one sign only, and each Sanskrit sign always represents the same sound. This phonetic aspect of Sanskrit distinguishes it from many of the world's languages. The basic graphic unit of Sanskrit is the aksara, or syllable. All consonants are equal in Sanskrit and it does not have capital and small letters, such as the a and a in English. However, vowels do not have an independent status in Sanskrit, unlike English and several other Indo-European languages. In Sanskrit, vowels co-exist with the consonants in order to achieve phonetic clarity. The Vedic Sanskrit hymn 2.2.4 of the Aitareya Aranyaka explains the consonants to be the body of a verse, the vowels to be its soul voice, and the sibilance as its breath. This intimate relationship between the vowels and the consonants are embedded in the numerous writing scripts for the Sanskrit language. <laughs> Brahmi script. The Brahmi script for writing Sanskrit is a modified consonant syllabic script. The graphic syllable is its basic unit, and this consists of a consonant with or without diacritic modifications. 
Since the vowel is an integral part of the consonants, and given the efficiently compacted, fused consonant cluster morphology for Sanskrit words and grammar, the Brahmi and its derivative writing systems deploy ligatures, diacritics and relative positioning of the vowel to inform the reader how the vowel is related to the consonant and how it is expected to be pronounced for clarity. This feature of Brahmi and its modern Indic script derivatives makes it difficult to classify it under the main script types used for the writing systems for most of the world's languages, namely logographic, syllabic, and alphabetic. The Brahmi script evolved into a vast number of forms and derivatives, states Richard Solomon, and in theory, Sanskrit can be represented in virtually any of the main Brahmi based scripts, and in practice, it often is. Sanskrit does not have a native script. Being a phonetic language, it can be written in any precise script that efficiently maps unique human sounds to unique symbols. From the ancient times, it has been written in numerous regional scripts in South and Southeast Asia. Most of these are descendants of the Brahmi script. The earliest datable Varnamala Brahmi alphabet system, found in later Sanskrit texts, is from the 2nd century BCE, in the form of terracotta plaques found in Haryana. It shows a schoolboy's writing lessons. States Solomon. Topic: <inaudible> Nagari script. Many modern era manuscripts are written and available in the Nagari script, whose form is attestable to the first millennium CE. The Nagari script is the ancestor of Devanagari, North India, Nandinagari, South India, and other variants. The Nagari script was in regular use by 7th century CE, and had fully evolved into Devanagari and Nandinagari scripts by about the end of the first millennium of the Common Era. The Devanagari script, states Banerjee, became more popular for Sanskrit in India since about the 18th century. However, Sanskrit does have special historical connection to the Nagari script as attested by the epigraphical evidence. The Nagari script has been thought as a North Indian script for Sanskrit as well as the regional languages such as Hindi, Marathi and Nepali. However, it has had a super-local status as evidenced by 1st millennium CE epigraphy and manuscripts discovered all over India and as far as Sri Lanka, Burma, Indonesia and in its parent form called the Siddhamatka script found in manuscripts of East Asia. The Sanskrit and Balinese languages Sanar inscription on Balanjong Pillar of Bali, Indonesia, dated to about 914 CE, is in part in the Nagari script. The Nagari script used for classical Sanskrit has the fullest repertoire of characters consisting of 14 vowels and 33 consonants. For the Vedic Sanskrit, it has two more allophonic consonantal characters, the intervocalic la la and la la. To communicate phonetic accuracy, it also includes several modifiers such as the anusvara dot and the visarga double dot, punctuation symbols and others such as the halanda sign. Other writing systems Other scripts such as Gujarati, Bangla, Odia and major South Indian scripts, states Solomon have been and often still are used in their proper territories for writing Sanskrit." These and many Indian scripts look different to the untrained eye, but the differences between Indic scripts is "...mostly superficial and they share the same phonetic repertoire and systemic features," states Solomon. They all have essentially the same set of 11 to 14 vowels and 33 consonants as established by the Sanskrit language and attestable in the Brahmi script. Further, a closer examination reveals that they all have the similar basic graphic principles, the same varnamala literally, garland of letters, alphabetic ordering following the same logical phonetic order, easing the work of historic skilled scribes writing or reproducing Sanskrit works across the Indian subcontinent. The Sanskrit language written in some Indic scripts exaggerate angles or round shapes, but this serves only to mask the underlying similarities. Nagari script favors symmetry set with squared outlines and right angles. In contrast, Sanskrit written in the Bangla script emphasizes the acute angles while the neighboring Odia script emphasizes rounded shapes and uses cosmetically appealing umbrella-like curves. Above the script symbols, in the south, where Dravidian languages predominate, scripts used for Sanskrit include the Kannada, Telugu, Malayalam and Grantha alphabets. Topic. Transliteration schemes, romanization 
Since the late 18th century, Sanskrit has been transliterated using the Latin alphabet. The system most commonly used today is the IAST International Alphabet of Sanskrit Transliteration, which has been the academic standard since 1888. ASCII-based transliteration schemes have also evolved because of difficulties representing Sanskrit characters in computer systems. These include Harvard Kyoto and ITRANS, a transliteration scheme that is used widely on the Internet, especially in Usenet and in email, for considerations of speed of entry as well as rendering issues. With the wide availability of Unicode-aware web browsers, IAST has become common online. It is also possible to type using an alphanumeric keyboard and transliterate to Devanagari using software like Mac OS X's international support. European scholars in the 19th century generally preferred Devanagari for the transcription and reproduction of whole texts and lengthy excerpts. However, references to individual words and names in texts composed in European languages were usually represented with Roman transliteration. From the 20th century onwards, because of production costs, textual editions edited by Western scholars have mostly been in Romanized transliteration. Epigraphy The earliest known stone inscriptions in Sanskrit are in the Brahmi script from the 1st century BCE. These include the Ayodhya Uttar Pradesh and Hathabada Gosundi near Chittorgar, Rajasthan inscriptions. Both of these, states Solomon, are essentially standard and correct Sanskrit, with a few exceptions reflecting an informal Sanskrit usage. Other important Hindu inscriptions dated to the last centuries of the first millennium BCE, in relatively accurate classical Sanskrit and Brahmi script are the Yavanaraja inscription on a red sandstone slab and the long Nanahat inscription on the wall of a cave rest stop in the Western Ghats. Besides these few examples from the first century BCE, the earliest Sanskrit and hybrid dialect inscriptions are found in Mathura Uttar Pradesh. These date to the 1st and 2nd century CE, states Solomon, from the time of the Saka Kasatrapas of the early Kushan Empire. These are also in the Brahmi script. The earliest of these, states Solomon, are attributed to Kasatrapa Sodasa from the early years of 1st century CE. Of the Mathura inscriptions, the most significant is the Mora Well inscription. In a manner similar to the Hathabada inscription, the Mora Well inscription is a dedication inscription and is linked to the Vaishnavism tradition of Hinduism. It mentions a stone shrine temple, pratima murti, images, and calls the five Vrishnas as Bhagavatam. There are many other Mathura Sanskrit inscriptions in Brahmi script overlapping the era of Indo-Scythian northern satraps and early Kushanas. Other significant 1st century inscriptions in reasonably good classical Sanskrit in the Brahmi script include the Vasu Dorjam inscription and the Mountain Temple inscription. The early ones are related to the Brahmanical, except for the inscription from Kankali Tila which may be Jaina, but none are Buddhist. A few of the later inscriptions from the 2nd century CE include Buddhist Sanskrit, while others are in more or less standard Sanskrit and related to the Brahmanical tradition. In Maharashtra and Gujarat, Brahmi script Sanskrit inscriptions from the early centuries of the Common Era exist at the Nasik Caves site, near the Gurner mountain of Junagadh and elsewhere such as at Kanakura, Kanheri, and Gunda. The Nasik inscription dates to the mid-1st century CE, is a fair approximation of standard Sanskrit and has hybrid features. The Junagadh rock inscription of Western satraps ruler Rudradaman I c. 150 CE, Gujarat is the first long poetic style inscription in more or less standard Sanskrit that has survived into the modern era. It represents a turning point in the history of Sanskrit epigraphy, states Solomon. Though no similar inscriptions are found for about 200 years after the Rudradaman reign, it is important because its style is the prototype of the eulogy-style Sanskrit inscriptions found in the Gupta Empire era. These inscriptions are also in the Brahmi script. The Nagarjunakanda inscriptions are the earliest known substantial South Indian Sanskrit inscriptions, probably from the late 3rd century or early 4th century CE, or both. These inscriptions are related to Buddhism and the Shaivism tradition of Hinduism. A few of these inscriptions from both traditions are verse style in the classical Sanskrit language, while some such as the pillar inscription is written in prose and a hybridized Sanskrit language. 
An earlier hybrid Sanskrit inscription found on Amaravati slab is dated to the late 2nd century, while a few later ones include Sanskrit inscriptions along with Prakrit inscriptions related to Hinduism and Buddhism. After the 3rd century CE, Sanskrit inscriptions dominate and many have survived. Between the 4th and 7th century CE, South Indian inscriptions are exclusively in the Sanskrit language. In the eastern regions of the Indian subcontinent, scholars report minor Sanskrit inscriptions from the 2nd century, these being fragments and scattered. The earliest substantial true Sanskrit language inscription of Susunia West Bengal is dated to the 4th century. Elsewhere, such as Dehradun Uttarakhand, inscriptions in more or less correct classical Sanskrit inscriptions are dated to the 3rd century. According to Solomon, the 4th century reign of Samudragupta was the turning point when the classical Sanskrit language became established as the epigraphic language par excellence of the Indian world. These Sanskrit language inscriptions are either donative or panegyric records. Generally in accurate classical Sanskrit, they deploy a wide range of regional Indic writing systems extant at the time. They record the donation of a temple or stupa, images, land, monasteries, pilgrims travel record, public infrastructure such as water reservoir and irrigation measures to prevent famine. Others praise the king or the donor in lofty poetic terms. The Sanskrit language of these inscriptions is written on stone, various metals, terracotta, wood, crystal, ivory, shell and cloth. The evidence of the use of the Sanskrit language in Indic writing systems appears in Southeast Asia in the first half of the first millennium CE. A few of these in Vietnam are bilingual where both the Sanskrit and the local language is written in the Indian alphabet. Early Sanskrit language inscriptions in Indic writing systems are dated to the 4th century in Malaysia, 5th to 6th century in Thailand near Si Tep and the Sak River, early 5th century in Kutai East Borneo and mid-5th century in West Java Indonesia. Both major writing systems for Sanskrit, the North Indian and South Indian scripts, have been discovered in Southeast Asia, but the southern variety with its rounded shapes are far more common. The Indic scripts, particularly the Pallava script prototype, spread and ultimately evolved into Mon Burmese, Khmer, Thai, Laos, Sumatran, Celebes, Javanese and Balinese scripts. From about the 5th century, Sanskrit inscriptions become common in many parts of South Asia and Southeast Asia, with significant discoveries in Nepal, Vietnam and Cambodia. Texts. Sanskrit has been written in various scripts on a variety of media such as palm leaves, cloth, paper, rock and metal sheets, from ancient times. <inaudible> Influence on other languages For nearly 2,000 years, Sanskrit was the language of a cultural order that exerted influence across South Asia, Inner Asia, Southeast Asia, and to a certain extent East Asia. A significant form of post-Vedic Sanskrit is found in the Sanskrit of Indian epic poetry—the Ramayana and Mahabharata. The deviations from Panini in the epics are generally considered to be on account of interference from Prakrits, or innovations, and not because they are pre-Paninian. Traditional Sanskrit scholars call such deviations arsa, arsa meaning of the arsases, the traditional title for the ancient authors. In some contexts, there are also more prakritisms borrowings from common speech than in classical Sanskrit proper. Buddhist hybrid Sanskrit is a literary language heavily influenced by the Middle Indo-Aryan languages, based on early Buddhist Prakrit texts which subsequently assimilated to the classical Sanskrit standard in varying degrees. <laughs> Indic languages Sanskrit has greatly influenced the languages of India that grew from its vocabulary and grammatical base, for instance, Hindi is a Sanskritized register of Hindustani. All modern Indo-Aryan languages, as well as Munda and Dravidian languages have borrowed many words either directly from Sanskrit tatsama words, or indirectly via Middle Indo-Aryan languages tadbhava words. Words originating in Sanskrit are estimated at roughly 50% of the vocabulary of modern Indo-Aryan languages, as well as the literary forms of Malayalam and Kannada. Literary texts in Telugu are lexically Sanskrit or Sanskritized to an enormous extent, perhaps 70% or more. 
Marathi is another prominent language in Western India, that derives most of its words and Marathi grammar from Sanskrit. Sanskrit words are often preferred in the literary texts in Marathi over corresponding colloquial Marathi word. Interaction with other languages Buddhist Sanskrit has had a considerable influence on East Asian languages such as Chinese, state William Wang and Kaofan Sun. Many words have been adopted from Sanskrit into the Chinese, both in its historic religious discourse and everyday use. This process likely started about 200 CE and continued through about 1400 CE, with the efforts of monks such as Yuji, Anxi, Kongju, Tianju, Yan Fodao, Faxian, Xuanzang and Yijing. Further, as the Chinese language and culture influenced the rest of East Asia, the ideas in Sanskrit texts and some of its linguistic elements migrated further. Sanskrit has also influenced Sino Tibetan languages, mostly through translations of Buddhist hybrid Sanskrit. Many terms were transliterated directly and added to the Chinese vocabulary. Chinese words like Sha Na Chana, Devanagari, Kasana Kasana instantaneous period were borrowed from Sanskrit. Many Sanskrit texts survive only in Tibetan collections of commentaries to the Buddhist teachings. The Tengyur Sanskrit was a language for religious purposes and for the political elite in parts of medieval era Southeast Asia, Central Asia, and East Asia. In Southeast Asia, languages such as Thai and Lao contain many loanwords from Sanskrit, as do Khmer. For example, in Thai, Ravana, the emperor of Lanka, is called Thosakanth, a derivation of his Sanskrit name Dasakantha, having ten necks. Many Sanskrit loanwords are also found in Austronesian languages, such as Javanese, particularly the older form in which nearly half the vocabulary is borrowed. Other Austronesian languages, such as traditional Malay and modern Indonesian, also derive much of their vocabulary from Sanskrit. Similarly, Philippine languages such as Tagalog have some Sanskrit loanwords, although more are derived from Spanish. A Sanskrit loanword encountered in many Southeast Asian languages is the word basa, or spoken language, which is used to refer to the names of many languages. English also has words of Sanskrit origin. Sanskrit has also influenced the religious register of Japanese mostly through transliterations, these were borrowed from Chinese transliterations. In particular, the Shingon lit. True words. Sect of esoteric Buddhism has been relying on Sanskrit and original Sanskrit mantras and writings, as a means of realizing Buddhahood. <inaudible> <inaudible> Modern era Liturgy, ceremonies and meditation Sanskrit is the sacred language of various Hindu, Buddhist, and Jain traditions. It is used during worship in Hindu temples. In Newar Buddhism, it is used in all monasteries, while Mahayana and Tibetan Buddhist religious texts and sutras are in Sanskrit as well as vernacular languages. Some of the revered texts of Jainism including the Tattvartha Sutra, Ratnakaranda Sravakakara, the Bhaktamara Stotra and the Agamas are in Sanskrit. Further, states Paul Dundas, Sanskrit mantras and Sanskrit as a ritual language was commonplace among Jains throughout their medieval history. Many Hindu rituals and rites of passage such as the giving away the bride and mutual vows at weddings, a baby's naming or first solid food ceremony and the goodbye during a cremation invoke and chant Sanskrit hymns. Major festivals such as the Durga Puja ritually recite entire Sanskrit texts such as the Devi Mahatmaya every year particularly amongst the numerous communities of eastern India. In the south, Sanskrit texts are recited at many major Hindu temples such as the Meenakshi temple. According to Richard H. Davis, a scholar of religion and South Asian studies, the breadth and variety of oral recitations of the Sanskrit text Bhagavad Gita is remarkable. In India and beyond, its recitations include simple private household readings, to family and neighborhood recitation sessions, to holy men reciting in temples or at pilgrimage places for passers-by, to public Gita discourses held almost nightly at halls and auditoriums in every Indian city. <laughs> <laughs> Literature and arts More than 3,000 Sanskrit works have been composed since India's independence in 1947. 
Much of this work has been judged of high quality, in comparison to both classical Sanskrit literature and modern literature in other Indian languages. The Sahitya Akademi has given an award for the best creative work in Sanskrit every year since 1967. In 2009, Satya Vrat Shastri became the first Sanskrit author to win the Jnanpith Award, India's highest literary award. Sanskrit is used extensively in the Carnatic and Hindustani branches of classical music. Kirtanas, bhajans, stotras, and slokas of Sanskrit are popular throughout India. The Samaveda uses musical notations in several of its recessions. In mainland China, musicians such as Sa Dingding have written pop songs in Sanskrit. Numerous lone Sanskrit words are found in other major Asian languages. For example, Filipino, Cebuano, Lao, Khmer Thai and its alphabets, Malay, Indonesian Old Javanese English Dictionary by P. J. Zotmulder contains over 25,500 entries, and even in English. Over 90 weeklies, fortnightlies and quarterlies are published in Sanskrit. Sudharma, a daily newspaper in Sanskrit, has been published out of Mysore, India, since 1970, while Sanskrit Vartman Patram and Vishvasi of Ritantam started in Gujarat during the last five years. Since 1974, there has been a short daily news broadcast on state-run All India Radio. These broadcasts are also made available on the Internet on Air's website. Sanskrit news is broadcast on TV and on the internet through the DD National Channel at 6:55 a.m. IST. Topic: <laughs> Schools and contemporary status. Sanskrit is one the 15 languages of the eighth schedule to the Constitution of India. The Central Board of Secondary Education of India CBSE, along with several other state education boards, has made Sanskrit an alternative option to the state's own official language as a second or third language choice in the schools it governs. In such schools, learning Sanskrit is an option for grades 5 to 8, classes V to 8. This is true of most schools affiliated with the Indian Certificate of Secondary Education ICSE board, especially in states where the official language is Hindi. Sanskrit is also taught in traditional gurukulas throughout India. A number of colleges and universities in India have dedicated departments for Sanskrit studies. Topic: In the West. St James Junior School in London, England offers Sanskrit as part of the curriculum. In the United States, since September 2009, high school students have been able to receive credits as independent study or toward foreign language requirements by studying Sanskrit, as part of the SAFL, Samskritam as a Foreign Language program coordinated by Samskrita Bharati. In Australia, the Sydney Private Boys High School Sydney Grammar School offers Sanskrit from years 7 through to 12, including for the higher school certificate. Topic. European studies and discourse European scholarship in Sanskrit, begun by Heinrich Roth and Johann Ernst Hanxelden is considered responsible for the discovery of an Indo-European language family by Sir William Jones this research played an important role in the development of Western philology, or historical linguistics. The 18th and 19th century speculations about the possible links of Sanskrit to ancient Egyptian language were later proven to be wrong, but it fed an Orientalist discourse both in the form Indophobia and Indophilia, states Troutman. Sanskrit writings, when first discovered, were imagined by Indophiles to potentially be repositories of the primitive experiences and religion of the human race, and as such confirmatory of the truth of Christian scripture," as well as a key to "...universal ethnological narrative." The Indophobes imagined the opposite, making the counterclaim that there is little of any value in Sanskrit, portraying it as "...a language fabricated by artful Brahmin priests." with little original thought, possibly copied from the Greeks who came with Alexander or perhaps the Persians, scholars such as William Jones and his colleagues felt the need for systematic studies of Sanskrit language and literature. 
This launched the Asiatic Society, an idea that was soon transplanted to Europe starting with the efforts of Henry Thomas Colebrook in Britain, then Alexander Hamilton who helped expand its studies to Paris and thereafter his student Friedrich Schlegel who introduced Sanskrit to the universities of Germany. Schlegel nurtured his own students into influential European Sanskrit scholars, particularly through Franz Bopp and Friedrich Max Müller. As these scholars translated the Sanskrit manuscripts, the enthusiasm for Sanskrit grew rapidly among European scholars, states Troutman, and chairs for Sanskrit, "...were established in the universities of nearly every German statelet", creating a competition for Sanskrit experts. <laughs> <laughs> Symbolic usage In Nepal, India and Indonesia, Sanskrit phrases are widely used as mottos for various national, educational and social organizations. India, Satyameva Jayate, Satyameva Jayate meaning, truth alone triumphs. Nepal, Janani Janmapumisha Swargadapi Garyasi meaning, mother and motherland are superior to heaven. Indonesia, in Indonesia, Sanskrit are usually widely used as terms and mottos of the armed forces and other national organizations see, Indonesian armed forces mottos. Rashtra Suakatama, Rastra Savakatama people's main servants is the official motto of the Indonesian National Police, Tri Dharma Eka Karma, Tri Dharma Eka Karma is the official motto of the Indonesian military, Kartika Eka Pashhai, Kartika Eka Paksi Unmatchable Bird with Noble Goals is the official motto of the Indonesian Army, Adhitakarya Mahatvavirya Nagarabhakti, Adhitakarya Mahatvavirya Nagarabhakti Hard Working Knights Serving Bravery as Nation's Hero is the official motto of the Indonesian Military Academy, Upakriya Labda Prayohana Balatama, Upakriya Labda Prayohana Balatama. The purpose of the unit is to give the best service to the nation by finding the perfect soldier, is the official motto of the Army Psychological Corps, Karmanya Vadakaraste Ma Falashiu Kadachana, Karmanya Vadikaraste Ma Falazu Kadachana. Working without counting the profit and loss. Is the official motto of the Air Force Special Forces Paskas, Jalesu On the sea and land we are glorious. Is the official motto of the Indonesian Marine Corps, and there are more units and organizations in Indonesia either armed forces or civil which use the Sanskrit language respectively as their mottos and other purposes. Many of India's and Nepal's scientific and administrative terms are named in Sanskrit. The Indian Guided Missile Program that was commenced in 1983 by the Defence Research and Development Organisation has named the five missiles ballistic and others that it developed Prithvi, Agni, Akash, Nag and the Trishal Missile System. India's first modern fighter aircraft is named HAL Tejas. In popular culture Satyagraha, an opera by Philip Glass, uses texts from the Bhagavad Gita, sung in Sanskrit. The closing credits of The Matrix Revolutions has a prayer from the Brihadaranyaka Upanishad. The song, Cyber Raga, from Madonna's album Music includes Sanskrit chants, and Shanti, Ashtangi from her 1998 album Ray of Light, which won a Grammy, is the Ashtanga Vinyasa Yoga chant. The lyrics include the mantra Om Shanti. Composer John Williams featured choirs singing in Sanskrit for Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom and in Star Wars, Episode I, The Phantom Menace. The theme song of Battlestar Galactica 2004 is the Gayatri Mantra, taken from the Rigveda. The lyrics of The Child in Us by Enigma also contains Sanskrit verses. See also Devanagari Eastern Nagari List of Sanskrit-related topics Mator India's Sanskrit village Sanskrit numerals The Spitzer Manuscript Notes <laughs>